Welcome back to the Chad Hasty Show on News Talk 95.1 FM and 790 AM KFYO. And joining us on the phones right now, editor of the Quorum Report, our good friend Scott Braddock. Scott, good morning. How are you today? Doing great. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. It's uh, it, it's it's a, a nice, quiet Monday, right? <laughs> Nothing happening at all. <laughs> Uh, the, I'll see you later. Yeah, exactly. There's just it's uh it's it's downtime. That's uh that that's what's going on. It downtime is the interim, you know, people just need to kick back and enjoy. Yeah. You know, back to school time, you know, kids are yeah. being, you're, post you're, the you pictures know, on Facebook and Facebook and enjoy. dropping the kids off at the you know, first day and all that. It's always very cute. Yeah, absolutely. On the My daughter, uh, you know, my daughter eighteen, she will not allow that anymore. No, she won't allow no the picture? pictures. No, no pictures. No, forget that. She's too cool for all of us. Believe me. Oh, sure, of course. That's uh, that's how it happens, right? Yes, sir. That's that. That's just that's that's life. That's what happens. Um, well, Scott, on Friday, let's let's put I guess the last few days uh, into a nutshell. Uh, on Friday, uh, Re- Representative Dustin Burroughs resigned as caucus chair of the. Uh, Texas House Republicans, uh, which I, I think everyone kind of saw coming. Everyone had a feeling that this was uh, probably going to happen. Uh, and then today on uh, Mark Davis's show out uh, out in Dallas, uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, uh, fresh out of the hospital, uh, yeah. decided to make a little bit of news and say that uh, not only could this impact if this continues to go on, this this scandal between uh, the House Speaker, uh, Representative Burroughs, and Michael Quinn Sullivan, if this continues, it could impact uh, re- the, the retention of the House. But also, yeah, let's release the tape. Let's re- let release the audio and let everybody hear it. Release the tape. Uh, Patrick said, I really think everyone needs to hear the tape. Of course, he joined Speaker Bonin in asking for the tape of the meeting uh, that uh, was held on June 12th uh, you know, to be released, to be put out there so that people can hear it. Uh, so far, as you know, Michael Quinn Sullivan of Empower Texans has only allowed select folks to listen to the audio. It seems that, you know, that enough people have heard it now that uh, some of the claims would seem to be more substantiated. You know, at first it was only a few people saying that uh, the speaker had uh, offered to give these folks media credentials, take my media credential away in exchange for uh, them spending their dollars in certain ways in uh, the March primary, specifically going after 10 Republicans, that's the allegation, uh, in the March primaries, 10 on the alleged speaker's hit list. Um, And this morning Patrick said he wouldn't take sides. Which is interesting to me, Chad, because you asked a great question last week, and I've been thinking more about it, because, look, I think you're right to say, hey, does the average Texan care about this? Does the average voter even care about this? I would say that certainly the average Republican voter does. I think that people are kind of tuned into this deal, and as we talked about last week, it's really gotten um, uh, more attention than usual uh, when you talk about speaker politics. Usually it's only folks in Austin that care about speaker politics. You know, when um, Speaker Strauss uh, was on his way out toward the end of his tenure, that's when Lieutenant Governor Patrick really started really, you know, hammering him hard, and they really had the big throwdown about the bathroom bill, and that actually got national attention, right? Uh, If people started to know who the Speaker of the House was, typically if you were to poll, you know, who's the governor, just name ID, who's the governor, everybody knows that, who's the lieutenant governor, you know, a few, fewer, either fewer people who know that, but still has a higher profile than the Speaker does, the speaker's generally just an insider's concern. Uh, you know, people who are really into politics know who the Speaker of the House is. And some of the feedback I got um, last week, you know, as this story was going national, on the same day that Burroughs was stepping down as GOP caucus chair, the story hit the New York Times. Uh, yeah. And so people all across the country have now uh, seen this, uh, you know, if they, if they care to read The Old Gray Lady. And, uh, you know, um, you had Bonin. Um, basically returning the Speaker's office to a pretty low-profile thing, right? They didn't have drama. There were no big blow-ups in the session. And so some of the feedback when the story went national, some people actually asked me from around the country, they said, I thought you had that Speaker uh, Joe something. You know, they, 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 a lot of folks didn't even realize that he had retired and been replaced with somebody else. So Bonin had sort of done a good job of, you know, making it low-key again. Now all of a sudden it's nationally out there again who the Speaker of the House is in Texas. And it's not for a good reason, right? And you have uh, the lieutenant governor, 
saying that he won't take sides. Governor Abbott last week was asked about this during his town hall uh, that he held in the wake of the El Paso shooting, um, and Abbott would only say, you know, look, it's a good thing that the Texas Rangers are investigating, that they will offer, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, you know, basically they won't take sides politically in this. They'll just do an investigation, which is appropriate. Um, and the lieutenant governor, uh, who, of course, had been uh, hailing Speaker Bonin's performance during the session um, this morning, uh, Patrick just saying, uh, well, I'm not going to take sides. Let's have that tape come out so that everybody can uh, decide. And to your question about whether people really care about this, maybe they don't, but I think here's why it's more important, or here's what's important about it. It denies Republican leaders the argument that they want to make going into 2020. Remember, coming out of the legislative session, the argument and the narrative from Abbott, Patrick, and Bonin was what? It was GOP leadership united gets results, yeah. right? They were making progress on property taxes, school finances, et cetera. They were making some progress on substantive issues, and they weren't having blow-ups about things like bathroom bills, even though there was you know, some other sort of subtler red meat, like protecting chicken sandwiches, for example. But, but most of it was about those substantive things. Now they can't make that argument. Remember, uh, right after the session, you saw videos uh, on YouTube and on Twitter and Facebook, and this seemed to be where they were going to go with the overall argument for a campaign next year. Uh, there were the uh, videos of Patrick and Abbott and Bonin, you know, walking around the governor's mansion lawn and, uh, you know, talking about how they had made progress on these big issues. And you're not seeing those videos promoted now, are you? Yeah. Uh, because you have Abbott and Patrick sort of trying to keep distance uh, from Bonin as he goes through this. Uh, scandal, and I don't think it's behind him. I think you still see, even though he's asked for forgiveness, and there's a growing number of uh, Republican House members who have said that he ought to be forgiven for saying terrible things. We still don't have all the facts on this. The Rangers have just started, or just you know, going to get underway with their investigation after being asked uh, to look into it by lawmakers. Um, but for right now, the Speaker is sort of radioactive, and going into 2020, um, if this lingers then Republicans can't make the argument that they wanted to. They'll have to come up with something else. Yeah, but but he can still raise money. And uh, and, and he can Maybe. still, yeah, you know, send out money. I, I think it was smart of Patrick to not take sides because uh, un, unless he has heard the audio and he hasn't gone public with it, uh, until you do hear the audio, how can you take a side? I mean, it, it, th- this is why the audio should be released. And, and Scott, correct me if I'm wrong here. The... The only people who have not wanted the audio released were either within the Empower Texans organization or connected to it somehow, right? Yeah, only only the people who are in control of the audio. (laughs) You know, uh, Michael Quinn Sullivan uh, and a few of the people uh, who have been, uh, I would say, their uh, beneficiaries, if you will, of their largesse. Uh, Steve Toth, for example, who's a uh, state representative from the Woodlands said that he didn't think that the audio ought to come out publicly because he said there's such awful things that are being said by the speaker on this uh, recording. Uh, and Michael Quinn Sullivan has said the same. He said that the reason that he's not releasing the audio, uh, and this reason has been uh, you know, disputed by some others who heard the audio, like Matt McCoviak on your show, for example, who's the Travis County Republican Party chairman. Sullivan says it would hurt the Republican Party, um, you know, McCoviak and others said that's just not the case, uh, and other conservative thought leaders have said the same, uh, that this isn't about whether it would hurt the Republican Party or not, uh, that the truth needs to come out. Um, and uh, look, uh, again, uh, Empower Texans acting as if they're claiming that they're a media organization. Um, I think everybody agrees, conservatives and liberals alike who have looked at this, moderates and everybody else have said, if they were acting as a media organization, they would release the audio, because look, there's a long history in the United States of you know investigative journalism and undercover journalism, right? I mean, that is a thing that goes on. Yeah. Um, but when you find corruption, as they claim that they did, then you would release the evidence. Uh, you know, if you're media, you would release the evidence of what you say um, is corruption in government, and they have refused to do that so far. Well, and uh, you you look at another group, and whether people like them or don't like them or believe them or not, the the Project Veritas group that goes in, they do a lot of these undercover. They never re- they they don't have stories that go on for three weeks or four weeks and go, hey, <laughs> we've really- got a video. It's <laughs> really good and it's really damning, but we're not going to release it. We're not going to release it because it would damage the subjects of the video. Right. They don't do yeah, that. They, they would, just they, they, they release the video, and they, right. they, they do right so. Far, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and, and again, this is not ideological either. You know, this whole question about whether uh, empowered Texans ought to have media credentials was, uh, you know, uh, mentioning this on social media today. It was talking about the fact that, um, you know, the Texas House and Senate don't decide who is a journalist. I, I think that would be dangerous to have the government in charge of who's media, or who's a journalist. Uh, they don't have that power under the First Amendment. They do have the power to decide who's on the floor of the Texas House and Senate during their deliberations, uh, as became, uh, you know, painfully obvious to me during the legislative session. <laughs> but, uh, but I would say um, that they should have that right uh, to decide who's on the floor of the House and Senate. Um, and if a group is not acting, um, you know, in good faith as media here, I think it hurts their case for trying to get uh, media credentials. Remember, Empower Texans is, you know, suing in federal court over uh, being able to get media credentials for the Texas House, where they have been denied so far. They're taking that uh, appeal to the Fifth Circuit uh, in New Orleans, and we'll see how that turns out. Um, but I think to add credibility to their argument, they could release the tape and uh, let everybody decide and let the chips fall where they may. Well, and and let's be honest, uh, uh, the lieutenant governor has has been someone who has benefited from Empower Texans and, and you know, the donations, and he is saying, release the audio. It, the longer this drags on, it hurts right. the Republican Party. Uh, it, in my opinion, it, it, it does hurt the, uh, the opinion that uh, Sullivan and others have that if we release the audio – It'll hurt the Republican Party. Th- things have been damaged already. Release the audio and and let the chips fall where they may. Let it move on. Um, you know, the, again, this is not the way a media organization would act. This is the way that political op- operatives act, uh, which Empower Texans is. And of course, they have every, every right to be that. But to then also claim to be media doesn't seem to hold water. Uh, Scott, I want to ask you about uh, the the uh, Texas hardline stance on marijuana. Mm-hmm. Talk about that and the investment portfolio of the state. This is really interesting. Uh, Ryan Poppy, my friend over at Texas Public Radio in San Antonio, got the scoop on this. It turns out that the state's permanent school fund committee has an investment worth about $700,000 in a public company called Innovative Industrial Properties. (laughs) You can guess what Innovative Industrial Properties does. Hmm. They own and lease land to marijuana businesses in 12 states. Really? And of course, as we've, ta- yes, as we've talked about here on the show, uh, you know, during the legislative session was a big point of contention, you know, whether you would have medical marijuana, certainly recreational men- marijuana use is not something that uh, is even close to being legalized in Texas, where it has been legalized in some other places. Um, but, uh, you know, when they are looking at trying to grow uh, this fund, which benefits public schools, um, you know, the people who are making the investments over there, uh, you know, they take a look at uh, which stocks would be smart to invest in and which stocks would grow in value. Uh, and, of course, across the country, you're seeing more efforts to legalize marijuana. And so there are companies that um, are, you know, legitimately traded on Wall Street. Canopy comes to mind and some others um, that, uh, you know, that people are, uh, you know, sort of rolling the dice. Uh, but it turns out that, uh, you know, in this $34 billion fund, one of the things that they're investing in is uh, one of these, uh, yeah, it's a real estate investment trust that deals with uh, with marijuana. Uh, and this uh, has been going up uh, since they bought it, uh, since they <laughs> since they decided to get involved with this uh, investment. Uh, it has been paying dividends and, uh, and they, you know, and the folks at the uh, Permanent School Fund and the State Board of Education, uh, they defended this. Uh, as, look, you know, it's not hypocritical. Uh, for one thing, uh, the state board doesn't make the decisions about, you know, whether marijuana is going to be legal in Texas. That's the legislature and the governor and lieutenant governor uh, who, again, have taken the hardline stance. But when you're, you know, figuring out what's going to be in your investment portfolio, you know, most folks try to be dispassionate and just figure out which stocks are going to go up. And uh, right now, um, it looks like marijuana-related companies like this, uh, they're going through the roof, some of them are. I would say that's a pretty wise investment. It's fascinating. I mean, yeah. you know, it's it's for the same reason that you would invest, for example, in Square. You know, whenever you go to a small business and they have you run your credit card through the yeah. little Square deal. Yeah. Um, you know, I was reading about how Square wants to be able to do small business loans, and uh, you know, this is not related to the marijuana thing, but um, you know, one, if they if they are going to do small business loans, it could be a good investment and could continue to you know accrue in value because, guess what. Um, they know exactly what the cash flow of the businesses, uh, you know, what the what the cash flow situation is. So they know which businesses would be better risks to give loans to. So you know, you just look at it dispassionately and say, okay, this is going to go up. Well, for the state on this deal, marijuana is going up. Yeah, really mm. interesting. 
Uh, Scott, before I let you go, I want to ask you about uh, Beto O'Rourke 5.0, uh, the, the uh, angry <laughs> Beto strikes back. Uh, you've got his cam- his campaign, his presidential campaign, keeps on saying that we're you know they're they're not under any scenario are they going to run for Texas Senate, and I didn't think they were going to. But has he completely nuked any chance he has in the future of running for statewide office? After I mean, he's getting angrier and angrier, and now saying that America was founded on racism and America is racist. Yeah. Th- that, to me, doesn't sound like what was the attempted moderate Beto when he was running against Cruz. I think that it's not necessarily true that he's nuked his you know, potential future of running for uh, Senate. I don't, I don't think that he wants to. I think, I think it's other people that are having this argument. You, know, you saw the uh, Houston Chronicle say that he ought to come back to Texas and run for Senate, and then I think it was the paper down in Corpus that said, that, said the opposite, that he needs to keep running for uh, the White House, so sort of warring uh, editorial boards at war. Um, but, but uh, you know, I think uh, that we learned something in 2018, uh, which is that the Texas electorate moving forward may not be quite as conservative um, as it has been previously. I mean, we have we found a lot of new Democrats voting, that, you know, last year. Uh, how many people are going to, you know, continue to vote in 2020, and how many more will come out uh, who? Uh, maybe a little more of the liberal persuasion. I think you still have more Republicans. You do have uh, an effort by the Republican Party, and it is acknowledged uh, by Republicans that they do need to find more Republican voters, uh, which is, I've never seen that in my career covering politics in Texas, uh, that a, a significant um, amount is going to be spent on trying to register new Republican voters. You know, we've talked about this group called Engage Texas, which wants to find one million new Republican voters. Yeah. So there is an acknowledgement by the GOP, you know, quote unquote, establishment uh, that more Republican and conservative voters need to be found. So when folks start saying, and I get, I, I mean, I get it. I think that being way too far to the left is probably um, not a, not a, you know, not an easy sell in Texas or around the country, for that matter. Frankly, when you when you look at who the Democrats could nominate. Uh, for the White House, that's going to be key, and whether they can even be competitive with President Trump. Um, but uh, but I wouldn't say that uh, moving a little bit more to the left uh, means that he can't run for Senate. I just don't see any evidence that he wants to do that. It seems like he's you know he's committed. Whether it's Beto 5.0, 6.0, 7.0, whatever, he's going to keep running for the White House. Yeah, no, I I, I don't think he's I, I don't think he wants to run against Cornyn. I, I don't think he has any desire to. I don't think he ever has. I, I think that yeah. it was it was it's White House or bust. Uh, you know, my my whole thing is I, I think that the the further that he moves to the left, if he wanted to run for governor uh, against Greg Abbott in the future, mm-hmm. okay, okay. Well, with some with some of the things that he has said lately, good luck with that. I, I don't think it'll that would work out too well for him. But yeah, uh, we'll, we'll see what the future of Texas looks like. I guess. Trying to stand out, you know, in this field of let's just be frank, very liberal candidates for the White House, uh, and trying to sound as liberal as possible. I don't know how much it would damage future runs in Texas, but I, I, I can say that uh, you know it, it is the reality of trying to run uh, in this field. Where look, you got Biden, who is sort of occupying the uh, you know the part of the primary that has to do with being a more moderate sort of Democrat. And who are the rest of them that have any shot at that? You know, the governor of Montana probably doesn't have a real shot. He's he's a little more to the center. Uh, But uh, I don't think, you know, he's got any real chance of being the nominee. So uh, everyone else is just trying to out-liberal each other. we got to get going. Tell folks that they can find at Quorum Report. Check us out there at quorumreport.com. Sign up for our free email alerts at quorumreport.com. We'll let uh, you know what's going on with all this stuff down at your state capitol. Very nice. Scott, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Chad. That's Scott Braddock, editor, Quorum Report.